Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and I'm very sorry about the fire alarm that's just gone off. OK, I think it's just a test. Um, so uh, this talk uh, is about the UK flood hydrology roadmap. It's being hosted by SIWEM, as we've heard, and, and presented, promoted jointly with the British Hydrological Society. Um, and just by way of background, I'll, I'll explain that I, I was one of a, a, a number of people um, involved in the developments of the roadmap from, from, from its early days, and was a member of, of its steering group. And, and I'm currently chairing the scientific and technical advisory group to the roadmap, which, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about in a few minutes. Um, the talk was originally um, about a 25 year plan of action, which is which is what the roadmap is. Um, it was published last March, so um, I've made a hasty correction here. Um, and that's uh, well, it's now really a, a 24 year ahead uh, plan. So I'm going to say a little bit about how the roadmap emerged uh, uh, um, a quick recap um, and, and then talk a bit about progress to date and, and what's coming next. Uh, the views that I'm presenting in this talk are, are, are my own, um, but uh, large parts of, of the talk draw on material that was um, published in a commentary piece in the in the peer-reviewed journal hydrology research so that was a paper that came out last year just after the roadmap um, and uh, so i want to acknowledge the input to that work from um, from my co-authors on on the piece um, most of whom were also uh, involved either in the the um, steering group for the roadmap or or in the project team that uh, that, that delivered it Hopefully, um, I think the links to the roadmap itself and, and some of that supporting documentation will be appearing in, in the chat window on this Zoom call. So the roadmap was uh, initiated in 2018 through the DEFRA Environment Agency NRW Joint R&D Program for Flood and Coastal Risk Management. And as I say, published in, in March last year. Um, and, and the idea really was to set an agenda and an action plan for, for, for the next 24 years or for a 25 year span um, for flood hydrology and, and, and to base that very much on a co-creation process um, so, that it, so that it is a, a community owned roadmap and, and you know, not reflecting um, solely the views of, of any one or, or just a small number of, of stakeholders. So um, during that co-creation pro process, there were more than 270 people involved um, from 50 different organizations. Um, and over a 23 month period, which, which did include um, some uh, disruption because of the COVID pandemic, um, there, were, there were seven different modes of engagement um, that were that were employed uh, in in the development of the roadmap. Um, in our hydrology research paper, we set out a a, um, a flowchart um, that detailed that that process. I'm I'm not going to attempt to talk through through that in in detail now. But but the key point I suppose to take away from this is that it was, you know, it it was a, a serious effort, um, quite an involved process, um, with uh, different opportunities for um, as wide a range of people as possible to get involved, have their say and influence the roadmap. Um, and and I, I mentioned seven different points of engagement. Those, those really broke down into four types. So there were some questionnaire surveys. Um, there was a, 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 some workshop activities. Um, there was a very uh, open um, public facing online survey. Uh, and also some working groups that that contributed to to the to the developments of of the of the roadmap. Um, and hopefully you can see on the right hand side of the slide here, um, there's some analysis showing the breakdown of different sort of stakeholder representation throughout that process. Um, so um, strong input throughout and across all the modes of engagement from uh, from UK wide public sector organisations. 
um, also from private industry uh, and um, from academic uh, um, researchers. Uh, and, and then also there, were, there, were, there was um, in, input from, from other, other stakeholders um, in, you know, that, that, that might fall into to different categories. So that the co-creation pro process led to um, the uh, the published roadmap, um, which uh, and, and developed a vision, which you can see on the on the slide here for for UK flood hydrology over the coming twenty five years, um, and that that vision recognizes a, a you know a, quite a range of fundamental issues, in, including environmental change uncertainty as a as a fundamental aspect of of hydrology and and flood management um and you know in in, in a sense the very concept of risk management is 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 a, a kind of rational um way of of dealing with uncertainty um the vision recognized um discussion of of the role of data science of the integration of different hydrological processes and also physical systems that are related to to flood hydrology, um, including things like geomorphology, water quality, and, and also socio and, and, and economic systems. And, and very importantly, the vision recognized the importance of, of leadership uh, and collaboration. Um, the, uh, the vision um, in turn supported the, de the, the, the development of four, uh, four themes, uh, which were data, ways of working, uh, methods, and, and scientific understanding. Um, and uh, across those four themes, um, there were 31 uh, actions um, that uh, this are set out in, in some detail within the roadmap documents, um, and, uh, and, and also the, you know, the process that, that, that led to them being identified. I'm just going to skip back briefly as well because I, I when I talk about this I, I always try to emphasize the you know the real we um, wealth and uh, and depth of intelligence that that was uh, um, gathered and, and is contained within the the roadmap co-creation process um, and and in particular um, the data that, that that is presented within the appendices and, and the, the, the questionnaire and survey responses and, and that's it, and that was published alongside the roadmap. So in those in those supporting documents there, there's there's a huge amount of useful information, and I I, I really um, sort of implore people to, um, to to look at that. Of course, the roadmap didn't emerge in a vacuum. Um, it has a UK focus, um, and it was, I, I suppose, you know, its genesis was within the um, the practitioner or, or, or practice practice research um, uh, innovation space. Um, but but it but it 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 it, 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 it developed, you know, in a way that was informed by a much wider context, um, in, including work that was done um, at, at around the same time. Uh, by a working group on the future of UK hydrology um, uh, that was uh, sponsored by the British Hydrological Society. And that, that working group has published a number of, of journal papers. Um, the development of the roadmap occurred alongside the, um, the scoping for a number of scientific programs and, and, and perhaps the largest of which is the, um, the UK Research and Innovation Flood and Droughts research infrastructure program um, and, and that's of course is a, is a long-term on, on, ongoing program and uh, the roadmap also um, of course exists within an international context um, and we did some work to uh, look at how it maps onto the international association of hydrological sciences um, work on, on the 23 unsolved problems in hydrology, the 23 UPH paper that was, um, that was published um, a little bit before the, the roadmap. Um, so the, the, the circular diagram here shows um, in, in the upper left segments, um, the topics that were identified through that IASH um, community 
um, work on, on the 23 unsolved problems. Uh, that was a very wide ranging um, uh, international um, uh, scientific scoping project. And then on the on the lower right hand side, um, we've got the um, the actions, the 31 actions identified within within the roadmap, uh, and and each of those um, each of those chords indicates a, a, a relationship between um, the unsolved one of the unsolved problems topics and something that features within the roadmap, and those were produced using a um, using a data mining text analysis technique that that was uh, um, described in our hydrology research paper. Um, so the point really that, that this is is making is that there's you know there's pretty good um, cross correlation if you like in, interrelation between um, between the international scientific uh, agenda and and the topics within the roadmap with perhaps um a, a few uh, uh areas where there are gaps um particularly around the interfaces between hydrology and water quality um health and the social sciences and you know to some extent those may also reflect the, the difference in in framing of these two studies and and that the um the, the the 23 uph are taking a very broad view of of um, of hydrology as a whole, whereas of course the the roadmap was was focused on flood hydrology. Um, so that that's the background really. Um, I want to just turn now to looking at the uh, at the progress that's been made since the roadmap was published last year. Um, there's been a lot of work going on, um, some of which has been visible, and and some of which is 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 you know perhaps perhaps been um, been going on in the background. Um, but just to to try to simplify what's been done and to boil it down, I, I, I want to point out, you know, two really important mechanisms for the delivery of the roadmap in the long term that this have, um, you know, that are now established. Um, and those are the Environment Agency's Flood Hydrology Improvements Program, or FIP, um, and the establishments of what I'll call broadly collaboration structures, uh, and and in particular um, the governance and and advisory boards um, for the roadmap. So I'm going to going to say a little bit about each of those um, in in the next few few slides. So the Environment Agency FIP um, is is now a well established program. It's um, uh, I've the um, the the diagram diagram in the bottom left here um, is a a snapshot of progress in the FIP based on the published list of of projects in in a in a February 2023 update, um, and obviously that that's already you know we're a little bit further along the line from there. So um, the basic message here is is tune in next Monday to the talk that's going to be given by Dr. Chris Skinner from the FIP team. For, for a more up-to-date view. Um, but nevertheless, uh, as of Feb 23, um, there were 19 projects identified within the FIP. Um, 11 of them sort of in progress actually, you know, lie um, uh, 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 either as project scoping or, or as, as work, um, you know, actually being delivered. Um, and, and, and of those 11, seven were, were live and, and in what, what one might call a, a delivery phase. Um, and, and in fact, um, already um, there were two projects that had completed their first phase, one of them leading to the publication of a report on, on relative uncertainties in, in flood hydrology um, through the modeling chain, and, and the second um, important output being the, uh, um, the hydrology data explorer. So I'm sure there'll be much more on, on detail on those, on those things next week, but you know, it's, it's fantastic to to see that even even within its first year through the FIP, the, there have been substantial, tangible, um, you know, deliverables uh, um, contributing to to the to the flood hydrology roadmap. Um, now it's important to comment that the FIP is not equivalent to the roadmap. Um, it's uh, it's making important contributions to it, and and one way of 
you know, perhaps visualizing that is, is to think of the FIP as taking bytes out of out of some of these um, these ac action wheels um, within the roadmap. I think maybe because it's a lunchtime talk, I was I was thinking about these as if they were pies or or pizzas or biscuits or something. Um, so FIP has certainly been taking some you know some 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 substantial bites out of those actions. Um, but just to just to put it into context, um, the uh, the roadmap as a whole has a 25-year vision and a and indicative sort of budgets between um, well of, of, of more than a hundred million million pounds. And within that, although there are 31 actions, you know there are, are an unknown number of projects that that could could contribute to the roadmap. Um, the FIP program is a six-year program, um, seven million pound budget, and and as I, as I mentioned, it has around 20. 20 projects so um you know being able to secure that level of resource already is a, is a tremendous achievement and, and step forward for, for uk flood hydrology but but clearly it's 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 a it's a contribution to to the roadmap and, and there's much more that that will need to be done um and specifically um the fip uh sets out to address and and is driven by three of the of the four roadmap themes. So those are the ways of working, data and methods themes. Um, and of course that leaves us with um, the fourth theme about scientific understanding, which is perhaps the hardest of the themes to, to define and, 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 and the you know and the and the most difficult to to plan for. Um, I just want to you know be clear here that um, I don't think the FIP is in, in in any way unscientific, so I'm not not trying to imply imply that it's leaving the science behind. Um, I know that much of the work going on within FIP has has strong links to scientific progress, but but it's you know by by its own um, uh, definition, it's not being driven specifically by the scientific understanding theme within the roadmap. So we need to find other ways to to advance in in that in that fourth theme um, and hopefully some of those advances will come through the um, through the governance and collaboration structures that, that have now been established so um, addressing the ways of working that there is now a governance board in place for the for the roadmap um, and uh, there's information about that um, on the British Hydrological Society and the FIP web pages and I hopefully those will have appeared or, or will appear soon um, as links within the within the chat window. Um, and also we now have established a scientific and technical advisory group to work alongside that governance board. And, and those two groups have come together with, with support and, and secretariat function being provided by um, the, uh, the key partners across the UK um, and also with, um, with volunteer uh, input um, from from a number of different sectors. So just looking at the governance board, the representation there is Department for Infrastructure, Northern Ireland, NRW, SEPA, the Environment Agency, UK Research and Innovation, um, which for, for anyone on the call who's, who's not familiar with the research funding landscape is the main funder for, for academic research and, and innovation sort of transfer um, in, in the UK and the British Hydrological Society. Um, and, you know, in terms of, of progress to date, there's a memorandum of, of understanding now being signed between those regulatory authorities and, and the BHS to really to underline and enable the continuing support and, and commitments um, to the roadmap from across the UK. Uh, you know, one of the key roles of the governance board uh, as well as, as taking a strategic view of the roadmap and, and monitoring progress against this is to to seek the funding and resources to ensure that it, it you know it, it can continue to to be delivered um, and that's already happening um, and and uh, you know and resources are being identified and um, through the work of the governance board which is which is fantastic uh, alongside the government's board, we now have a scientific and technical advisory group established. So that was advertised through an open process in uh, last year uh, and established 
with its first meeting in January this year. It has 15 members. They, um, they come from a range of different backgrounds. You can see a, a, a breakdown on the, in the, um, the donut diagram. Uh, on on the right hand side, um, although I should say that you know some members of that group sort of sit in in a number of different roles, um, so so there's 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 fairly good representation there um, across different interest groups. Um, I'm currently chairing that group, but uh, one of the first decisions we made as a group was to to have a rotating chair so that we you know we can hopefully encourage um, um, numerous different voices. Um, to to um, you know to be heard um, uh, from from the from the group um, and really the the stag um, for short is uh, hopefully going to be and already is a, a forum for debate about the research gaps um, research priorities and how research work aligns with the roadmap and then. You know, from the more practitioner side, where the knowledge gaps are and and, and where the where the research needs are, um, and uh, based on its its discussions, it will offer advice and you know has been asked in in broad terms to offer advice to the governance board about um, knowledge gaps and and uh, and priorities. So the stag has had three meetings now. It's 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 beginning to establish, I think, its its ways of working, and you know, and and, and it will hopefully increasingly um, focus on on specific scientific and, and technical technical topics. Um, and I I think that's really important because the, those two boards and and perhaps the stag especially will help us as a community in navigating the the pathways to impact between research and practice. And that, you know, I, I think for, for anyone who's involved in the sort of innovation process will we, we'll appreciate that it's rarely a, a straightforward linear linear process. So it, so it really is a case of navigating, you know, um, different knowledge and understanding about where scientific progress is being made, where the practitioner needs are and how those two things should, should align. Um, so the, the the roadmap as a whole, you know, sets out uh, in 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 broad terms um, those pathways to impact. And uh, as I said earlier, it, it does contain some really deep dives into into the needs and and drivers for for progress and, and the evidence behind behind those, um, which you know I would really re recommend to anyone as a as a sort of a guide to understanding the. Um, the, the impact and impact potential of, of research. And, and just to highlight this in Appendix H the, of the roadmap, there is a detailed analysis of how different parts of the roadmap agenda will map onto flood risk management outcomes. So, you know, that that to my mind is almost literally mapping out pathways, pathways to impact um, between uh, practice and, and research. So I hope that the science and technical advisory group, you know, we, it is becoming a forum for for debate uh, and understanding of of those, um, you know, of that process and, and and where those knowledge gaps are. Um, just to give you a sense of of some of the things that are that are now being identified by the stag um, for for future discussion. So those include looking at the outputs of the FIP programs projects as they report or complete and, and uh, you know and trying to understand their wider context within the roadmap what, what their implications would be for the longer term and, and where there are, are remaining gaps um, to discuss the skills survey that has been carried out um, through the FIP um, to understand the relationship between quality standards and um, the benchmarking of models and methods in, in flood hydrology, and you know those are two areas that, where there will be work, um, substantial work um, be, being initiated in, in the near future. Um, sort of related to that as a technical topic, we think there's a need to 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 understand more about how sensitivity analysis in in general can be applied in flood hydrology, and and that includes um, understanding its relationships with the topic of uncertainty. 
um, and also you know differentiating it and understanding how it how it compares with the use of sensitivity analysis in, in other areas in, including hydraulic modeling um, and we think there's probably a need to to look at um, artificial intelligence and its relationship with with flood hydrology and of course th there will be other topics that should be discussed and the yellow highlight there is just to remind me to come back to this in my my final slide um, i think that ai is a good example of of why um, the groups such as the stag and the governance board are important in in enabling the the roadmap to, to evolve and to continue to be relevant um, perhaps so this is a this is a, a little test that i ran um, earlier today with the um, microsoft bing version of chat gpt and the dali um, generative ai system um, and you know it suggests maybe rumors of the demise of human expertise are, are possibly exaggerated um, we, we might get to the point of um, you know, being able to get the spelling right at, at, at some points, hopefully. Um, but, but having said that, um, of course, you know, many people have already been working in, in broadly in the areas of, of AI and, and data science um, in hydrology and flood management. And these are clearly powerful and important technologies. So, so here's another test from this moment, from this morning. Um, I, I haven't actually taken this code and run it myself to check that it works, but um, uh, you know, a quick look at the relevant Python libraries suggests that it's probably about right um, to uh, to run an analysis of of, of trend detection in, in river flows. Um, and so, in, in addition to the you know to the to the work on um, data in, in data science on on machine learning and, and other aspects of AI that, that's been going on for some time. Um, the very rapid progress that's been made recently in, with large language models and generative AI, you know, is perhaps really accelerating the need to, to, to understand its role in, in, in flood hydrology. So, so what's coming next? Well, um, over this summer, there is work underway to develop a um, a detailed communications and engagement plan for, for the roadmap. Uh, that's um, that's being supported by um, by the government's board and, and, and given some resources, um, and will bring in the board and, and the science and technical advisory group. Um, and you know, I, I I hope that what one of the things that we can do through that comms and engagement plan is to um, is to continue working on how we understand wh where there is relevant research and where there are knowledge gaps that will sort of drive um, future planning for the roadmap and, and, and you know, and particularly how we link into that, that theme of scientific understanding. Um, there's already some work being done within the STAG to look at the coordination across relevant uh, research initiatives. So Nick, Nick Raynard in particular has been has been looking at the you know the interactions with the flood and droughts research infrastructure initiative, hydrojules, and you know and there are other major research initiatives, not none of which are necessarily sort of funded by a a, a, a project called UK Flood Hydrology Roadmap, but they're all hopefully um, positioned to make contributions to it. Um, we've also been um, doing some work within the STAG to scope out the relevant search terms for, for an analysis of research metadata. So the short way of thinking about this is, you know, what, what do we need to ask of research databases to try to understand what, what, what kind of relevant research is out there? Um, and John Lloyd from Arcadis has been, has been looking at that and, um, uh, and has had some, some conversations with, with UKRI about accessing their, um, their research databases. Um, and then the other, you know, the other way into that 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 question is, um, you know, how how do we get a good flow of information established between researchers and practitioners that can inform um, the uh, the governance board and, and and therefore inform the sort of the the um, you know the planning of, of future funding and future resources and and I think of that as really being about asking people the question, um, and so. Um, 
one of the things I want to do with this talk is to, is to ask you, I think there are 374 people on the call. Um, so, you know, ideas for um, individual sort of nuggets of information about research projects or practitioner needs and, and you know, and, and that we should be aware of and, and try to, to capture um, that, 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 that's all I think very much um, within the, um, within scope for um, for the stag and, and something that I you know I'd like to like to be able to capture. Um, and then uh, specifically in terms of um, upcoming events, um, well there's there's next Monday's webinar, so please do tune in to, to Chris's talk about the FIP. Um, there are two workshops um, planned. Uh, about the um, development of the project on benchmarking in, in flood hydrology. So Martin Borthwick at, at the Environment Agency is, is leading that through the FIT program. Those are on the 19th and 26th of July. And I think there's been um, there've, there's been public dissemination already about those events through, through various mailing lists. Um, but uh, um, for anyone interested, here's, here's another, another quick plug. Um, for those. Um, and there will be some more um, uh, information forthcoming about the outputs of the um, flood hydrology skills survey um, uh, in, 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 the, in the coming weeks and months. So I think I think that's it from me. I'll, I'll leave it there um, and um, I guess open up to, uh, to, to questions at this point. Many thanks, Rob. And please do remember to post a question in the Q&A function in Zoom if you have a question. There is one there already, Rob, and I think it relates to the Python code that you presented on one of your slides. It's quite a techie question, asking if the flow value denotes flow rate. Might be one we need to take offline, but if you're... Well, 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 possibly. I mean, I'm taking this as being um, this is the coding question, isn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm taking this as being a. Um, I, I mean, you could you could substitute any time series, I guess, for for flow here. Um, so, so the point of this is not that I would uh, um, recommend uncritically lifting this code out and, and running it. And as I say, I haven't checked it myself, um, but more that. You know, through generative AI, we're, we're already in a position where where we're able to, um, you know, to ask a question in natural language about something that is very technical, and, and get a get an answer back that um, I suspect in this case it isn't far from the the code that you would you would actually need to 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 implement um, implement that analysis. It's really interesting how AI will feature into this and maybe a. a whole separate topic. Uh, I had one question about the sort of research the STAG would be most interested in. Yes, um, thanks. So um, within the, the STAG, you know, we haven't really um, tried to place constraints on, on, on what, you know, what, what we think could be relevant research to 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 you know to, to take account of and um in, in this process of, of of understanding um where the priorities should should be for, for the governance board to, to look at um uh, i think a good starting point for that would perhaps be the 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 papers and reports that were generated by the bhs working group um, so those are, uh, are linked from the BHS website. Um, there was a paper on um, observational methods um, and another one on the development of a community sort of view of a perceptual model of UK hydrology um, that, that came out in, in hydrological processes. So I think those, those two papers certainly give a good sort of sense of a um, certainly a, a science driven scientifically oriented view of, of, of future um, future research needs in, in hydrology uh, but but really you know I I, I mean I, part of the challenge here is that actually it's it's very difficult just to go to a database and you know type in a search for hydrology research and and, and understand that you you're going to cover 
everything that might be of interest in in, in flood management. Um, so um, so that's why the, the process of sort of querying research databases is difficult, and and also why I think you know we really do need to be asking people to to come forward and 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 bring their their suggestions um, to to the the various groups that now exist. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, there's another question in the QA. Is any research considering techniques used in catastrophic modeling? Okay. Yes, I I, um, uh, I can't remember now whether catastrophe modeling or cat modeling was specifically mentioned in the roadmap, but you know my sense of it is that um, so for, for, for perhaps for you know for, for anyone on the call who's not familiar with the terminology here I, um, the the concept of cat modeling is something that's um, I would I would say developed largely um, through work done to understand risk for insurers and you know then more broadly um, the financial services and, and disaster risk financing sectors um, and, and those models tend to um, tend to be quite um, broad in terms of addressing multiple scales and, and possibly also multiple hazards um, and, and at looking at um, specifically at, at, at extreme loss events so you know, so a, a, a typical kind of analysis might be to ask what would be the one in 250 year um, financial loss during a, a, a flood event or maybe a compound flood or windstorm event, something of that nature. Um, so, I, I mean, to my mind, you know, there's been lots of interesting innovation um, within the cat modeling world. There's been lots of um, valuable scientific research that has been um, driven by, perhaps even funded by, and, and um, uh, related to the needs of, uh, for cat modeling. And, and you know, I, I think certainly it, it, it should be relevant to the, um, to the flood hydrology roadmap. Great, thanks for that. A few more questions coming in now. Can you tell me if there is a recommendation to capture flow data on small catchments, many having been previously decommissioned over the years? Honestly, I, I can't remember the road the roadmaps and, and its supporting documents are, are hundreds of pages long. Um, um, small catchments are certainly, you know, um, mentioned as a as a as a particular um, particular concern within it. Um, and, and obviously, you know, we've been, uh, I, I would I would think probably anyone working in flood hydrology would 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 realize would realize that. So. Um, as for recommendations in terms of of monitoring, I, the, the roadmap itself doesn't um, you know doesn't set out a a specific recommendation or a detailed business case for monitoring you know in terms of let's say numbers of gauges or where they should be or whatever, um, but it does broadly within the data theme. And, and perhaps also in in the scientific understanding themes, there are you know there are clear drivers for um, looking at Im improving the um, the the information that we have across all areas of, of flood hydrology, uh, and and within the FIP, there's already work going on um, in terms of uh, looking at data uncertainties and, and data requirements. So I think you know I, I think that type of question about about data. Uh, and monitoring is is going to going to be and should be a, a recurring topic, you know, over the whole lifespan of of the roadmap. So we've got another one here. A potential gap for future stag focus might be the interfaces, dependencies on, and sensitivities to other components of the environmental and human systems and opportunities or requirement to benefit from improvements in their prediction, e.g. weather, climate, coastal zone. This usually feeds into thinking about compound hazards. And thanks for the update. 
Uh, this is from Hugh Lawrence at the Met Office. Yeah, I, I agree absolutely. Um, the uh, you know, and that's so those those interfaces with um, processes and systems um, that you know I, I suppose maybe traditionally haven't been sort of key features of, of flood hydrology. I think it's I think one of the one of the important steps forward that that's been made with the roadmap is is just you know making it clear that that we do need to to explore those 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 interfaces um and, and you know and, and build up more of a whole systems systems understanding so i i am glad to hear the comments and I, and I agree with it thanks for a useful comment with the push for nature-based solutions are there any thoughts to link hydraulic modeling with water quality modeling to better quantify the benefits of NBS? So again, it's a, it's another question, I suppose, perhaps about those interfaces. And I, and I commented um, earlier in the analysis that, that, you know, that looked at the relationship between the crossover of the roadmap and the IASH 23 unsolved problems that I think possibly on water quality and I'm you know using that very loosely um, to, to indicate you know what what what's in the water and what the water does to the environment um, uh, I, we you know perhaps although it's mentioned in the roadmap it, there's there's not a great deal of detail I think in there and I you know I think that's an area that we need to be picking up in, in terms of building more scientific understanding and then seeing how that that can be brought into into practical use so um i mean i I'm, I'm taking that as a useful sort of suggestion for for something that um goes on the on the broader um you know agenda for for for, for the science group um as, as as much as a question Great, thank you. Useful comment there. And does this roadmap go hand in hand with any set standards or would this roadmap eventually become a standard we work by? Yeah, so so quality standards is one of the action areas, one of the actions within the roadmap. And, I, and as I mentioned earlier, I think there's probably um, a, a connection between the idea of quality standards and, and the the so um, if you like the technical topic of, of benchmarking um, uh, models and, and methods. So um, the roadmap itself is not, you know, is, is not envisaged, I think it would be fair to say as a, as a quality standard, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a research and innovation sort of scoping and, 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 um, uh, and planning exercise, but um within that community engagement process that created it the ideas of establishing quality standards establishing benchmarks uh, you know and trying to do so in a way that is scientifically robust and that um helps us to deliver good work without constraining innovation Th those those issues all all came through and are, and are you know are represented in the roadmap Great, thank you very much. So just on that on that one, I think again a plug for Chris's talk next Monday. I don't know if he'll mention those projects specifically, but but there is also work already underway through through FIP um, on on those on those topics. Great, thank you, Rob. And there's no more questions in the Q and A box, so just leaves it for me to say thank you very much Rob for your presentation today and thank for you. everyone else who's able to join the call. Barbara has posted all the links in the chat along with some others linking to SIWEM and SIWEM's objectives so do take a look at those and try and join the call on Monday if you can. Thank you everyone, thanks Rob. Thank you.